Soon that makes it wrong. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session on uh, unseen forces, realizing resilience through behaviors and connections. My name is Michael Woolcock. I work in the research department here at the World Bank, and I'm uh, chairing a panel today that includes uh, Sarah Batmangleach, uh, Lucy Rest, Mareka Srimaras, and Patrick Barron. We're going to be talking about this idea or this concept of resilience, uh, not just as an analytical construct, but uh, as its operational manifestations uh, appear around the world. And we're going to be talking about some of those in, in our own experience, but hopefully also very much tapping into your experiences with this particular idea and practice as well. Uh, our, our thanks to Busara for helping to uh, host us this session, as I just said. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, work as diligently as we can with over the next hour uh, until 2.30. We have a, a, a soft, hard breach in the sense that we have a coffee afterwards, um, but hopefully we will be just sufficiently disciplined to, to keep within that space. Our time today will unfold across four different sessions. A first opening lightning round where the panel will introduce themselves and, and give one particular adjective to describe some of their work associated with resilience. Then we'll have a, a substantive section where we ask each other some questions uh, around this issue and how, how we respond to it in our different professional spaces. We'll then have a, a third, a second uh, lightning round where we'll just give some practical examples of this work uh, as in, in manifest in different operational activities around the world. <clears throat> and the session four, we'll just uh, try and get some feedback from you guys and some questions uh, in, into your experiences with this so that collectively we will uh, do what these kind of gatherings are supposed to do, uh, which is to share and learn and engage one another around some pretty complex sets of issues uh, in very in complex places. So that's our task for today. We're conscious that you have uh, other items on your menu that you could have chosen for this how, ways to spend this hour. Uh, we're grateful that you uh, checked the box next to us. And uh, thank you for doing that. And we hope that we can uh, make this interesting for you. Okay, so that's sort of <clears throat> where we are. Um, I'll just begin, as I said, by asking our panelists to very, very briefly introduce themselves, but then to also just provide 
I'm going to use a particular verb. I said an adjective, either it will be fine to describe a practical thing that in your experience people do to support resilience in FCV. We've got two minutes for each person. So uh, hopefully you've all practiced your lines and know how to keep within that particular time space. Uh, so uh, we'll just work down the panel. Um, actually, maybe we should start with, with Lucy first and she might be the more difficult one to, to reach. She's joining us from Denmark. Uh, Lucy, if you can introduce yourself briefly and then a word that describes a practical thing that people do to support resilience in FCV context. Okay, um, so my name's Lucy Rist. I'm by um, training a tropical ecologist and I've done a lot of interdisciplinary research throughout my career, which most recently took me to look at the topic of peace and peace building. Um, so I've come at that from... Uh, an ecological perspective using theories of ecological dynamics to try and better understand the processes that we might engage moving towards peace and, and also to look more critically at how we use this concept of resilience in peace building. So a word, please, Michael, can you clarify the word to describe? Uh, the, the, the describes a practical thing that people do to support resilience. Pause. Okay, <laughs> very good. All right, Marika. Switch this one on. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm Marika Shamiris. I'm a vice president at Busara, which is a behavioral science organization using trying to merge behavioral science with more complex challenges of that humans face these days. And my uh, describing activity of what people do um, in to have resilience. When I thought about this, I had Paul Harvey's voice in my head who immediately says, resilience of what to what? So I want to clarify. So in my case, I'm going to talk about the resilience of seeing possibility and resilience to fragility, violence, and conflict. And my active verb, very interestingly, builds on Lucy's, is wait. Because waiting is often not seen as an activity but it's sort of judged as the least active outcome. But I think that's completely wrong. And there are two types of waiting. There's type one, cynical and stalling. This is done by the people who hold the power and access to resources, who make very, very sure that nothing changes. So they wait it out as much as they can. And type two of waiting is constructive and hopeful. This is people who postpone a decision to the future in order to help maintain their hope in the present, because the hope is the most important currency that they have. And it also allows them to minimize change and disruption, which are very, very stressful for everything, including livelihoods and so on. And waiting is often the best option to minimize that disruption. And I think understanding waiting as an activity is really crucial for us because it also messes with our imagination of fragility, which always conjures up the image of fast, breakable, fragile. And of course, in reality, and we heard this this morning, I don't know if you were in the lightning talks where Mary Maker said, if you're in fragility, you often don't know, but actually so-called fragile situations are often the ones where you really, really are stuck. And it is very, very difficult to see any other option, but actually wait it out. Very good. Paddy. Thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. My name's Paddy Barron. My official title is Global Lead for Social Cohesion and Resilience and Acting Global Lead for Community and Local Development in the Social Sustainability and Inclusion Global Practice at the World Bank. <laughs> Um, Say again? <laughs> basically, I'm the FCV person in social development at the bank. Um, so that's that's my role. Um, my uh, my background is as political scientist and also working on community development issues, in particular in conflict areas, uh, mainly in Asia. Um, my word is adapt. Um, what I say is probably the opposite from what Marek has just said, which is essentially when you live in tumultuous environments, you need to alter your behavior, your thinking, in order um, to follow the basic human impulse of getting by and getting ahead. So I can say a bit more on that, but I uh, adapt. And I do have to say I had one reserve because we didn't coordinate. So I was worried that um, of the other three, you might pick, have picked mine, but thank goodness you haven't. And I hope I haven't picked yours, Sarah. No. <laughs> Very good. Sarah. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Just echoing uh, Michael's thanks, because we know there's a lot of competing discussions at the moment. So we're very grateful you chose ours. So I'm Sarah Batmagleach. I work here in the Fragility, Conflict and Violence Group, or FCV group, on analytics. Uh, and I'm also the co-lead for the study on resilience and FCV. 
along with my colleagues sitting in the front row, uh, who's our chat moderator, Catherine. Uh, we're also working closely with Marika and Busara, as well as Patty on the global study, which you'll hear more about today. So my first verb, and I'm already breaking the rules because I have two, um, will be communicating because resilience doesn't happen in a vacuum and you have to communicate with others. You have to reach out, mobilize your network, really see and, and weigh what your options are and how you're going to deal with this current situation. And figuring out what to do is impossible without first communicating. And the other important angle on communication and, and resilience is the role it serves in helping to resolve disputes, in preventing things from escalating into violence, or if violence has already taken place, escalating into worse or, or more widespread violence. So conflict resolution mechanisms, if you think about one of their verbs, one of their activities, it's communication. One has to actively opt in to communicate. And my second verb is hoping, having hope. So I worked on fragility and hope in 2018, and I thought there's something significant here. And then I sort of put it to the side, and now six years later, approaching it from the resilience angle, and lo and behold, hope is, is rearing its head again, its pretty head, not its ugly head. And, and my hypothesis here is that it's an essential emotion especially in FCV environments. We tend to talk about anger and grievance and other emotions, which are also important, but I don't think we understand nearly enough of how hope affects decision-making, as well as the ability of people to even see or feel capacitated to act upon their resilience. So communicating and hope, hoping. Very good, thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Wilcock. I work in the research department, as I said. I've also uh, teach part-time at the Kennedy School at Harvard. For many years, uh, I've been in various different engagements with the, the whole fragility space. I did a paper a few years ago trying to look at the, uh, the, the measurement criteria that we use to decide who is eligible for, for IDA funding and other things. I always thought that was probably the most consequential lines we have in development, and yet it's a very uh, strange line. <laughs> the, the consequences of being up above or below that particular line are vast. And so needless to say, lots of good, bad and ugly things happen around the construction of that line. So that's sort of the more the particular space that I worked in, but I'm also doing more recent work in um, in a once fragile state, but now a, a, a country really trying hard to to serve its own people, but also contribute to the world in, in Cambodia in particular. Uh, my word, I guess, when I was thinking about this was uh, showing up. <laughs> uh, maybe that sort of somehow reconciles our previous uh, verbs around patience, adapting, communicating, and hoping. A, a certain uh, now infamous film director once said that 80% uh, of success in life was just showing up. And I think that's, that's one of the most resilient things that people can do. And when their world has been shattered and when they're uh, confused, scared, and unsure of what things are going to be like, just showing up can be a really key first step um, that may entail simultaneously being very patient about things not being the way they were. It may entail adapting to that particular context or situation, lots of communicating with people, and lots of uh, hoping in the sense that merely showing up itself is an act of hope and being there and, and, and continuing on in, the, in that space when things don't look very hopeful. I think that itself is, is an act of resilience. Okay, so we're going to move now into the, these bigger sets of questions that we're going to pose to one another, uh, in particular how these words and concepts uh, as we've started with them manifest or not in various different uh, practical operational spaces. And it's very difficult to talk about that because it's in a room like this and the comfort of a place like this. So we've come up with particular words that help us to have a constructive conversation around these things. But we all know that the really hard work is turning that into action and turning that into something that can be funded, something that can be implemented, something that can be designed, something that can be evaluated and something that can be interpreted. And there's all different ways in which that very word in English can appear and, and be experienced as something quite different uh, in different languages around the world. So sorry, you've got a, a team of people wrestling with these kinds of questions or in your experience, at least so far, why is it so difficult to, to make that transition here? And what kinds of issues are you, are you going to be studying uh, that will help us potentially get both our minds and our hands around those particular ideas? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, I think the challenge of resilience is predominantly one of assumptions. It's a very 
powerful and evocative word. Not all words are. Um, I've even, I've seen it sort of on a t-shirt and we, our vocabulary from the development sector usually isn't emblazoned on t-shirts. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise. And that's been, that's been a double-edged sword because people think they instantly know what it means because it is a word that does mean something to everyone from the get-go. And this has not only led to the assumption that we're all talking about the same thing, but also the assumption that resilience for one person or one group is gonna be the same as for someone else. But instead we know that resilience is going to be one thing for a teenage girl who's trying to go to school during, during a conflict. It's gonna be another thing for a farmer who's facing increasing contestation with herders over scarce resources. Another thing for a teenage boy who's being pressured into joining an armed group or for his grandmother who's trying to prevent him from joining that armed group. So all of these situations require resilience, but issues of identity, gender, age, power affect the reality of resilience, even if all of these people are, are in the same community. But this initial assumption that we all know what it is means we tend to not then do the work and really unpack and dif differentiate it for different actors. And linked to this is the assumption that resilience is always something positive. So to my previous point about actors, social cohesion can absolutely be a positive source of resilience if, and it's a big if, you are included in the socially cohesive group. If you're in a minority outside group, that cohesion of others is not going to affect you similarly uh, in a positive way, right? So we have to be aware of this dual function that resilience can play depending upon where you sit in society and also things like temporality. So how sustainable and resilient is resilience itself? Something that can initially start as a form of FCV, for a form of resilience to FCV, for instance, communities taking in those fleeing from violence can, depending on other factors and over time, eventually morph into something more like resentment than, than the initial resilience. We've also been exploring whether there's a difference between what we tend to label as resilience, but is actually something more akin to resignation. This means things have gotten so bad and have been so bad for so long that to go back to my verb, there is no more hope. So while the situation appears peaceful and unstable on the surface, it's a negative piece and one born out of the fact that people have essentially given up, they're no longer showing up and they just don't think that change is, is possible. And further down that spectrum, we also know that resilience has the potential to be more even downright negative at the, at the outset. But the challenge here is how do, we, how do we judge that? How do we deal with it? And whose normative standards do we use? So to give an example here, we know that trafficking in illicit and illicit goods can be a critical source of economic resilience during times of conflict when there are very few other options for people. This is not something the bank will support with programming, but <laughs> it is still important to acknowledge the function it serves and the less rosy reality that resilience can, can play. We also tend to think about resilience in isolation, um, but the truth is it's part of the very fabric of a society's functioning. And therefore to really fully understand it, you also have to know how it works in conjunction with, with all the other threads. Um, but for a community of practice that prefers silos and sectors, uh, thinking in systems and, and in fabrics tends to be uh, quite difficult for us. And then finally, related to that from an operational standpoint, especially in FCV environments, there tend to be multiple different resilience conversations happening at the same time. So you might have disaster resilience, climate resilience. If you've got cities, you've got urban resilience. So how do all of these pieces of, of what I call the resilience puzzle fit together? Where are they mutually reinforcing and where are you kind of trying to shove something in, in, in a space where it doesn't quite fit? So with the generous support of the State and Peacebuilding Fund, we've recently launched a global study to try to confront some of these challenges head on and more deeply understand some of these nuances. We hope to bring greater clarity and specificity to both our analytics as well as our programming in FCV settings so that we can be much more intentional about first and foremost, what our underlying assumptions are and then what impact that has on our theories of change, our program design, our targeting, uh, as well as who, how, and what we, we actually measure. Very good. Okay. Lucy, we're going to turn to you now. Uh, 
as Sarah has indicated, we're dealing with different uh, drivers that, that require resilience, but we are simultaneously perhaps trying to uh, help people in the short run to, to be more resilient, but at the same time consolidate uh, an existing or a future peace process. So we're doing very different things potentially at the same time. Uh, what does it look like when we try to do that kind of work? And is there a way to ensure that there is some coherence and credibility when we're asking these terms to do that very different kind of work? What does it look like? Um, I think one of the challenges in coming up with any kind of answer to that question is we have to be extremely aware of our human lens. And with that, I mean our time perspective, our perspective over space of how individuals are connected, how communities are connected, how globally we're connected, also to our environment, our natural environment, not just to each other, to our financial systems, all of these things. So we're often looking very much on the, the surface when we attempt to diagnose how are these various different pieces interacting. And we're also looking very much at what can we see, you know, in the very short term time horizon. So the the reality is is much more kind of under the surface. And I think there we can end up with, we can end up creating quite a lot of chaos. You know, we think we're moving things in one direction and through met very often with the best of intentions and often with a lot of knowledge and experience behind that, but without the humility to recognize that we don't actually have the full picture, that the world that we're working in is extremely complex. It doesn't function in the way that the human brain might like to always assume at times, that if we know that this generates, if X generates Y, if we do more of X, we'll get more of Y. You know, it just, the dynamics operating are so complex, they don't, um, they don't work that way. So for me, I, my background doesn't, you know, doesn't include formal peace studies. I come to this topic with the lens of ecology and, uh, Sarah mentioned, you know, with the from her world, we're not so good with systems and fabrics. My world is all about systems and fabrics. So that's exactly how I look at it. And it is looking more at this underneath where we pay attention to things, dynamics and change. And really, it's a world of relationship. Ecology is all about relationship. And I think that's what we miss when we're looking on the surface. We're looking... Um, we're looking at maybe at the consequences of relationship and we see that, but we don't, you know, it's not obvious is X causing Y or is it causing Z instead? Um, so sometimes with the very best of intentions, then now I'm sort of moving into more developmental language, which isn't really my speciality, but maybe we have the goal of um, enhancing resilience of a community by doing some kind of water engineering project. But by the and so that seems like you know that should be obvious, shouldn't it? That should enhance this community's ability to deal with maybe climate change or um, problems with neighbouring communities who might interfere with their own water supply. Maybe boost their ability to grow their own food via agriculture. All these kind of things, and we could do that. But we could we could in a similar vein be eroding their traditional knowledge around water management and further down the line this water engineering project turns out to not be sustainable based on you know any number of financial political social circumstances and so the very thing which was the fundamental basis of resilience in that particular area we've uh, eradicated so yeah I think my answer is really when we try to interfere with what is an and I'm not I'm not advocating um, to not step in and help, but when we try to interfere without that humility that we actually know very little about how these things are all interacting over time and space, we can end up creating um, quite a mess. <laughs> um, yeah. Very good. You answered my second question, which was uh, going to be sort of how can we learn from these different uh, other domains where resilience is called upon and recognize that in acting in one domain, we, uh, without the knowledge of the other, we can then be working across purposes with one another. And I guess 
the implication of that is just having a much more perspicacious view, as it were, about these different forms and manifestations of resilience in different contexts, but also in response to very different kinds of challenges in a, in a space that is then very in- interconnected. Great. Yeah, thank you. We could, we could even take it a step further and be even more fundamental in using ecology as a lens. So mm. um, we could, if I'm a gardener, I mean, the garden is the most uh, familiar to all of us if we're talking about ecological systems. I can't force my flowers to grow. I can't force my cabbages or carrots to grow. All I can do is provide the conditions for that. And I think this is one of the big problematic areas for resilience is that we are trying to create it rather than understanding that it's actually something that emerges. And our attention is better placed, in my opinion, focusing on the equivalent of soil, water, nutrients, light. And um, that's challenging because those things take a lot longer to maybe uh, create ideal conditions and we don't immediately see the benefits of them. But I think ultimately it's what we're learning in this work. Very good. Thank you. Paddy, uh, n- another related concept that we talk about a lot, I mean, the, the world itself finds itself invoking a lot uh, over the last decades or so is this idea of social sustainability as a third part of a dialogue around environmental and economic sustainability. So tell us a bit about where you think resilience contributes to those kinds of discussions around sustainability questions generally and the, the, the social sustainability aspect in particular. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, so I think increasingly... Our discourse is around sustainability, and I think historically a lot of that came from thinking around economic sustainability in terms of financial management, especially at the macro level within countries. More recently, focus on environmental sustainability, obviously. But I think a bunch of us think that development, good development outcomes go beyond only the economic and environmental, both of which are important, that there needs to be social dimensions taken into account as well. So one of the projects that actually Michael and I and a few others have been involved in is trying to take this term of social sustainability and turn it into something that we can get our heads around. Because I think social sustainability, maybe a bit like resilience, is used in so many different ways and applied to so many different things. So the framework we've been thinking about through this is uh, four constituent components to social sustainability. The first being social cohesion. If you don't have cohesive communities or societies, things fall apart. The second being inclusion. If particular groups are are left out, we know that functionally that's not good for for development, but also normatively and aspirationally, this is a value that we hold true that groups, everyone um, independent of their identity should be included in development processes. And the third being uh, resilience. And here the thinking is that You know, in a world of shocks and slow running challenges, whether they be conflict, climate, economic shocks, um, we those will be wiped out if people are not resilient to them. You know, resilience is about the ability to contribute towards prevention, coping and preferably transforming the situation so it doesn't occur again in in the future. And so resilience is a key component. a key component of of this. The fourth component um, is what we're calling process legitimacy. Now here, I think this very much relates to Lucy's comments as well about resilience is not something we build, but something that we need to support that's already there, right? Now, you can push towards more inclusion, more cohesion. You can have a great World Bank project that's building resilience. But if it's done in ways that people don't think are legitimate, it's going to at the very least fail and at the very worst be resisted and potentially lead to contestation, which which can turn violent. And so so I think the you know the the broader lesson, and it's one I would agree with what Lucy was saying, is it's about understanding the environment, understanding how people perceive these things, what they perceive to be legitimate. And coming in as development actors to support that rather than coming in with our our own um, definitions and our own ideas about what will work. Very good. (laughs) Uh, On to Marika. Um, Your work and the work of your organization, Bursara, focuses a lot on these concepts of mental models. Um, Give us a short uh, overview of what you mean by that and then how those mental models shape how we think and respond to these uh, resilience issues. 
What is the problem? What causes it? How can we break down the drivers and factors? What is the solution? How can we sequence the solution? What is the theory of change? How can we scale the solution? How do we report on the indicators of the solution? How do I feel about all of this? I feel good because I feel on top of my work plan and I feel that I can report back on my KPIs. So clearly I've identified the problem and the solution and everything is okay. That was a mental model. A very prominent mental model that all of you nervous laugh in the audience. <laughs> You know, you're with me on this. So this is a very, very prominent mental model in international development. Everything kind of rotates around a particular way of making sense of the world, understanding rooted in culture, tradition, experience, emotion, many, many other things, memories, you know, generations of these kind of approaches. Mental models are also not so a fluffy concept. They are us kind of seeking reassurance in finding again what we already know. And in doing so, our neural pathways get strengthened and our mental model gets stronger. So it gets harder and harder for us to break out of a particular way of thinking. These are very much the unseen forces behind a lot of activity. And they're very, very powerful and they're very, very difficult to change. And the whole sector of international development sits on a fairly limited repertoire really of mental models. A lot of them are uh, built around metaphors of construction grounds, building sites, very interestingly gardening. Um, and gardening is kind of the softer version of the construction ground because it has this idea of tending, not the precise version that Lucy gave us, which is it's actually about creating conditions and then you let go of control. The gardening metaphor is still an, a metaphor of control, but just the kind of nicer ones. But really underpinning all of this is this idea of linearity, of growth, of control, of planability, and maybe crucially of problems and solutions. And it links to resilience because as Sarah said in the beginning, this is really also a battle over the imagination of assumptions and so on. And the mental model will very much determine what the FCV community thinks is possible or acceptable, what can be reported against, what can be funded within the space of supporting um, resilience. Okay. Your turn. <laughs> no, 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 actually, you had to speak. <laughs> totally unscripted, by the way. I wanted to talk a little bit. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit also about what it means for a behaviorally informed approach, because that is that is very much the kind of work that we also do. And I, I find it important to break that down because we have we hear a lot of talk at the Fragility Forum about the need for people-centered approaches and relational approaches. And it's often quite slapdash, right? It's like it sounds almost like a cavalier, quite nice idea that people like who can disagree it should be people centered right everybody wants people on board but it's often very cavalier in, in the sense of it gives very loose notions of participation and inclusion but understanding people is of course necessary on a much much deeper level because if you really want to understand behavior and decisions and personalities experiences emotions like hope and so on context how they all link together it really requires a completely different research lens. And this isn't a call for an agentic approach, right? This is not me saying on the everlasting battle between agency and structure, this is about agency. It is just taking very seriously that humans act in their context and they also create the context, right? So it's a new, mutually nurturing things. And it's really striking that if you look at program documents, including the ones that want to support resilience, humans tend to be absent, right? And that is hugely problematic. And we see that sometimes once we start actually looking at humans, we find very, very counterintuitive things to break down. For example, the point that I made earlier on waiting. Very often programs look at waiting and they say, oh, people aren't engaged. Or, you know, a very common complaint is, oh, the youth is idle. They just want instant gratification. And we did some behavioral research and it turns out, actually, if you've come out of a conflict, waiting is a pretty good, very rational response because your NGO and your program might be the 25th program that comes in and you know promises great, great change if you invest everything you have right now. And actually saying, I, don't, I can't spend my emotional currency on this and I sit back is a very, very solid response, but one that's very, very difficult for the kind of um, programming world to have wrap their head around. So I just wanted to, to break that down a little bit. And now, <laughs> now we get to the very unscripted part because we thought about this. We can't just have Michael as a moderator because this whole work has been about breaking down complex concepts and making them usable for practitioners. So, you know, as we're embarking on this project of seeking to understand what it means to frame the concept of resilience as it applies 
to FCV context, what advice do you give us? What should we be mindful of? What have you learned about this process? <clears throat> I'm going to give you a very Michael answer. <laughs> uh, and that answer is that this kind of concept, the resilience or many, many, many of the others that we've already used today, social science has a, as a, as a, a word for this too. <laughs> Uh, geez, 80 years ago now, uh, a philosopher called Walter Garley uh, introduced this wonderful idea called essentially contested concepts. And he put a whole bunch of different words that we use in social science, like democracy and freedom and elections and all sorts of words in and said, these words, will you can provide a dictionary definition if you insist upon it. You can look it up in a dictionary and those words will be there. Uh, but precisely because they mean so many different things to different people, they can mean different things at different units of analysis. They can mean different things when they're translated. They can mean all sorts of different things. There's, there isn't a world in which, you know, in 20 or 200 years' time, finally, Eureka, there will emerge the dictionary definition that matches onto a neat set of variables that we can throw into a regression stew and come up with some nice little flashing number that says, ah, it's significant, and now we have proven it to be so. Uh, essentially contested concepts do their work in the, exactly these kinds of forums where we don't have to have a universal agreement about what we're actually even talking about, but talking about it imbues it over time with substance, with a shared understanding that's emergent in the moment rather than because we're trying to do our bit to eventually get to a world in which there is a singular agreed upon universal definition of what we want to have. Mainstream social science wants there to be those kinds of confidence and uniformity because that enables us to compile big data sets and global rankings of who is more or less resilient than somebody else and da-da-da-da-da. You can make a very nice career doing that when you figure out how to collapse all this complexity into a single number. Um, but I come back, to, I've spent most of my career, I think, when I, when I reflect on it, dealing with essentially uh, contested concepts, and that's fine with me. And I'm okay with things that don't have clean definitions. I'm okay with a lot of parts of our lives, actually, love and everywhere elsewhere, grief, uh, that we all kind of know what those mean and what that, what that feels like. But does everybody everywhere have a universally shared understanding of that in ways we understand what atoms and... Uh, Positive positrons and other, other other items are no, and that's okay. It's a it's a virtue, not a vice. It's a strength, not a weakness. And not being intimidated by something being essentially contested, I think, just means we should be doing more of what we're doing right now, which is just putting all of this stuff into a public forum of one kind or another, and being sensible adults about how we talk to each other then about what these look like, what they feel like, how they manifest themselves. What are the limits around which we can try and put a log frame or an Excel spreadsheet when we're trying to tame all of that variation into something that's legible to our normal social scientific uh, trainings and sensibilities? So it's basically I'm saying just don't be intimidated by something that doesn't look like it's fully fleshed out or cleanly defined and easy to uh, mapping neatly onto sets of measurement tools. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay for terms to, uh, to be in that space, like development itself. Development itself is a quintessentially, essentially contested concept. It means so many different things. I, in my class at the Kennedy School, I opened the, the second week of my class by looking at all the languages spoken in a room, about 20 usually. What does this weird word, even in English, mean when it's in Arabic or Turkish or Swahili? And we have this great conversation about the many splendid ways in which this one word that's supposed to unite us all actually means really different things in different places. And that's just fine. <laughs> We're not a lesser field, a less rigorous field, less important field, just because we use words that don't happen in English, at least, to have a clear definition to them. So... Welcome to the world of discussions around resilience. It's in that same space, and we're doing our job collectively by having conversa serious conversations about them. Okay. <laughs> That's Michael's answer. Okay. Um, the second round. I, I'm going to start with you, Marika, since you've introduced us to these, this idea of mental models. Um, just for present purposes, can you help us sort of, if, if there is a juxtapositional space you can articulate between an old world and, and a newer world of, of mental models, where are you wanting us to, to move? Yes, yeah, so the old mental model is kind of what I outlined earlier, right? It's solutionism, it's this kind of very binary thinking problem solution, very, very different from what Lucy introduced us to. It's very agentic. It kind of has these almost these hints of bootstrapping, right? So if you find yourself in a tough situation, 
here are some ways that you can pull yourself up on the bootstraps, which we might support a little bit with programming. It's really about transactionalism. It's the idea that people will always seek out the most beneficial set up for them, get the best price for something, get, you know, everything is kind of imagined as a transaction, which is very often not how people make decisions. It's driven by the idea of growth and linearity. And it's also kind of driven by the idea that people are somewhat generic. That's the kind of idea of scalability. Um, and we don't need to pay that much different pay attention to difference. And Shifting that mental model, and I want to stress this, right? This is not a rethinking exercise. This is not about us just going, oh, let's let's put like an A and B list and then let's move to the B list because, of course, that's the same mental model, right? It just shifts the binary to the other side. And the mental model is all, it's like really visceral. It's really, really deep down. It's like, you know, I cannot imagine things working in any other way. And, and they're, they're self-enforcing, which is why they're so difficult to kind of break down. So understanding better these kind of mechanisms with which humans make sense of everything everything is really, really useful. And then actually building in exactly what you said, right? The mental model that we have right now seeks clarity and linearity and kind of certainty. And really, I mean, who are we kidding? We need to have a mental model that accepts contradiction and ambiguity as it does in resilience, right? And not dismiss them as something that becomes fluffy or where you haven't quite figured out your work plan and your theory of change, because there's a really profound and sort of almost embarrassingly simple statement to be made, which is that people are really genuinely unique, right? And that doesn't stand in the way of scaling. Simply acknowledging this doesn't mean that you can't still figure out ways of changing and working with systems. Um, so that is the, the shift in the mental model that I would advocate for. So in that moment, when somebody then usually, when I make this argument, somebody usually says, but then what's the solution? <laughs> that is the moment when it hasn't shifted. So, you know, that's what we need to get away from. Excellent. Lucy, you've taken us into different domains of inquiry where resilience manifests itself. Can you, I guess, just reprise some of that or give us another example of uh, how those uh, different mental models that may be associated with each of those different domains uh, how do we as professionals, development professionals, try and navigate those different spaces more, uh, more, more in a more informed way? Um, I would like to actually just go back to the to something more fundamental in all of that, which is this human lens. And as I've already stated, I'm not a, I don't have significant expertise in peace building and. Um, but I have uh, I have the ability to observe the world as we all do, and throughout a career to start to notice patterns. <laughs> and for me, working in the field of environment, sustainability, and development over these years, I see a pattern which, to me, appears as uh, a human lens or a human. I guess I'm turning the human lens back on itself. That we seem to have this habit of this cycle of finding new words. Some people use them one way, some people use them another. We argue a bit about what they mean. We accept the difference and we accept the diversity and then we kind of lose interest and we drift on to the next word. So we've had, you know, sustainable development and we have adaptation and we have vulnerability and we have resilience. And I wonder that there's also, this is why I used the word pause at the beginning. I wonder that there's also a need for a pause and maybe a bigger pause than there has been historically to reflect on, are we in such a cycle when it comes to peace building, sustainability, environment development? Is there something more fundamentally wrong? And maybe our, um, our need to kind of diagnose the problem in order to be able to find a solution is actually part of the problem, which I think the others are saying exactly the same thing. So I think not only uh, reflecting on the mental model that we're actually using, maybe in a certain circumstance in a certain country or region, but looking more broadly at our mental model. And maybe I don't I don't have a solution to to where we would go from there. But I think I do have a suspicion that we are in a bit of a cycle and this this fashion to find a new word, a new way to understand is part of what keeps us stuck. <laughs> and it's part of what also keeps us having forums like this. 
<laughs> Patty, you know, choose a concept that you're working on right now, like or at least the ones you've just spoken on with process legitimacy, social sustainability, resilience. How do we uh, help move uh, people's mental models implicitly, if not explicitly, you know, in ways that accommodate these re- uh, new articulations in a more sensible way, do you think? Yeah, so when I saw this question, I didn't know what the old mental model was, but I agree completely (laughs) with Marika and Lucy. Um, No, I think when, at least where I've been coming from some of this, and probably in the same way as as Sarah, right, is looking at many of the risk and resilience assessments, which is kind of the conflict assessments the bank do, and looking at the types of ways in which resilience was conceptualized within them, right? And typically, I think there's a few characteristics to that. One is that it's something kind of at the margins. So you've got all these big drivers of conflict, and then somehow there's stuff going on at the community level that kind of helps people just about get get by, right? So it's divorcing itself from bigger power, forces of power into, into these things. Resilience is something that people have or do despite all the stuff going on um, around them. And then how we support that is by finding that and then giving money to the local CSO or the community to, to deal with that, right? Now, I'm not saying that's completely wrong, but I think that's that's a, a partial picture. And I think the part that's missed, and this relates a little bit to some of the some of the, the concepts we I was talking about before, is thinking about resilience in terms of contestation, in terms of Resilience is attributes that people have. Every individual is different. Certain structural characteristics may help you describe that in some ways, but it's never going to go fully there. And they exist within an ecosystem, a political, a social, and an economic ecosystem in which they're both individually trying to get ahead, but also trying to do something for the community and higher up as well, right? And so I think rather than thinking of resilience as the counterbalance to all the bad stuff going on. It's about realizing that the bad stuff and the way to manage that coexist together. And a lot of the job of development, and I, I would disagree slightly in that saying, I do think as we have to, we have to be searching for solutions. Now, when I say that, I don't mean there is a solution or that we're ever going to get there. But we are in an applied field. and I wouldn't be spending my career doing this if I didn't think what I was doing could at least help some people and move the needle a little bit. But I think a lot of that solution is is about not about taking what works somewhere or taking this idea of what resilience is and putting loads of money in somewhere else, but about trying to get that understanding of context and then trying to create these spaces in a balanced way that include those who aren't normally included. Um, and, and I think that can help us move forward. Okay. Just as a little fun little fact, I, before I came here, I just typed into Google uh, definition of resilient sort of dot, dot, dot. And sort of, what, what does Google fill out for you? And there are resilient persons or people, ecosystems, communities, and organizations. But actually number four on the list was resilient flooring. <laughs> um, so, so, so there you go. So that, that's how the world, the fourth most invoked application of this concept is actually to do with, uh, with flooring. Just, just, <laughs> just saying. All right. Sarah, how are you going to, how's your study going to help us uh, make sense of all this? <laughs> The flooring, I don't know. Um, so uh, this is the closest to role playing I get. Uh, so the old mental model, resilience is a powerful, constructive concept. It's obvious what it means. It's a good thing. So we need to build it. We need to support it. We need to strengthen it. End of story. No questions asked. And it's such a great concept. Let's make sure we use the word a lot everywhere. <laughs> and what needs to shift is, yes, it can be good. It can be powerful but we absolutely need to look more closely at how it functions, for whom we need to ask more questions and think more systemically about the role that it serves within the the fabric. And we need to have much greater comfort with the answer to those questions potentially being quite complex uh, and quite nuanced and possibly not even answers at all. Very good. Well, by my clock, we've got 10 minutes plus, and I want to maximize the opportunity for feedback from from you guys um so if you do have a question to pose or a comment to make please line up behind one and you're in this room please line up behind one of the microphones on each side of the room um but we'll be while you're doing that we'll go to our chat space uh and uh 
let's hear what people are saying or asking uh, online. Does it work? Okay, perfect. So we actually had two very, very excellent comments in the chat, which I found really interesting. Um, so the first one was trying to define resiliency to FCB. And the person said it's a relationship between institutions and civil society. And she argues that we often say institutions need strengthening in FCB states. But what she is actually saying is that this means also engaging with civil society. And for this person, one key obstacle is a lack of trust and mutual trust among the various groups in society. And that this trust takes decades to build. And I would even add moments to destroy. And it has to happen at the same time as institution strengthening. The other person, because I think it was also uh, as a response to all our panelists who gave a word to define a resilience, she gave another one and she said Versa versatility. Um, and she argues that resilience implies crisis is perpetual and adaptability is changing oneself to these issues. And to be versatile allows the individual organization to be a functional constant in any situation. And I found those two very comments extremely, extremely um, interesting. Now, we have one final question, which Sarah is going to love. How do we measure resilience? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. With a very loudly ticking clock, um, we've got five people wanting to make some comments. So I'm going to give you a minute each to articulate question or comment, and then we'll have a final round to uh, cherry pick the easiest questions to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm already messing up the microphone. Thank you all. Wonderful session. Um, just wanted to kind of make a comment and I have really enjoyed the session. I, I love the old mental model. Love to hear some social behavior change language and drivers and getting away from there's one solution, but wanted to throw out and kind of add to uh, resilience being access to support systems. Mm -hmm. So there, and then, then you get the individual community institutional levels, but like from day one, whether it's you're in a flood in Pakistan and you're a teenage girl, do you have your health and your health systems? Do you have social support? Do you have an aunt you can live with? Do you have financial support access? So when I think about it as an ecologist, Lucy, I, I think about those different systems. It's not one, but it's looking at these communities, these places, and it's it's different everywhere, but kind of mapping out what are your support systems? I loved the comment about um, there's already a system, there's already 20 projects that have been there. So I totally get the, the hesitancy, but what are their support systems? Where are the gaps here? And how can we help strengthen them and make them self-perpetuating. So that's where civil society comes in. So do they have the structures to come together, identify their problems, identify their own resources, mobilize them, and then look out. But to me, when I think of resilience, it's access to various support systems. So, and I saw that reflected, so love that. Great, thank you. Uh, I have to confess, I started planning this question as soon as I saw that the Pissarra Center was hosting a session. Uh, it's great to have you here. Um, so we've been talking about mental models. We've been talking about resilience, meaning different things to different people. Um, it's making me think a lot of the conversation that's been happening in the social sciences for the last 10 years or so about the replication crisis and the idea that a lot of our fundamental understanding of what makes people tick is based on studies of American undergraduates um, and is not relevant. In fact, there's a, a huge diverse world and that in fact, so many things like our risk appetite, our discount rate, who we trust, who we cooperate with, how we cooperate um, is heavily culturally inflected, heavily contingent, um, but we we just don't have an understanding of how that's different. There's a huge research gap of how that varies from place to place, but clearly that would be information we would need to inform interventions for resilience that we would want to do. So I'm curious to know, maybe particularly for Marika, but also for the, the other panelists in their organizations, um, whether to any degree, um, how has the replication crisis um, touched your work? Are we explicitly looking at this problem, trying to retest our understanding um, in different contexts? Are there particular factors maybe in FCV contexts? Tr trust is systematically different. I'm not sure something that, that we can be learning and finding out that can be informing our interventions. Thanks. Yeah. The weirdest people in the world, all that stuff. Yeah, very good. All right. Um, down there. <laughs> Hi, thanks. I'm Sophia. I work for the UK FCDO. So I wanted to ask a question on resilience at a slightly different level, which is that when we look at the world 
at the, the global level, international, so-called international norms and institutions, which I know have been long contested. But I think over in the UK, we've been having some conversations with some of our partners in the peace space. And there's a lot of concern about, you know, this feeling of kind of unresilience and that actually the very uh, contested and filled with hypocrisy, but nonetheless, somewhat of a consensus that's been there around some of the kind of international laws and norms is kind of fizzling away. Um, and that feeling of kind of loss of control and loss of trust in a way of things working, which had many problems, but was kind of all we had. And I just wanted to test that with you. Are you worried about that? And how can that kind of feeling affect our behavior, both in terms of people working in those institutions, but people working in a conflict who some may be voicing that feeling that the kind of last hope that they had is is no longer functional. Um, do you agree with that? What do you think we can do about that? Thanks. Yeah, I'm sure we've got that one figured out. So we look forward to giving you our... <laughs> okay. Yep. Hi, thanks, uh, Vanessa from UNICEF. Thank you so much for this uh, discussion. I really appreciated, you know, the bringing the humans back into the people-centered approaches. And and in that vein, I'd like to really encourage us to think, rethink a little bit uh, the way we do peace building programming. Um, there's, we've seen a huge emphasis, for example, on youth and adolescents and young people. When we try to do get funding or do peace building programming focused on early childhood development at UNICEF, it's seen as kind of like a little bit of a fluffy feel good thing, but, but, what we know about the way the brain develops in early childhood, the neural pathways that are formed in the first thousand days, um, the plasticity of the brain, the role that identity plays in driving con you know, in conflict and how early senses of identity are formed in children. I think it really um, calls for us to think a little more carefully about where we make those investments and how you know, how important it is to to make those investments early and not just, you know, obviously for children to develop, you know, normally they need nutrition, they need basic health care, they, you know, they need things that we provide in humanitarian settings, but we don't often think about child, child development, early childhood development, um, things like mental health and psychosocial support are, have been seen as a little bit of like, yeah, like the fluffy, nice add-ons, the extras, but not really the, the meat of what we're what we're trying to do. And I'd really like to encourage us as a community to to rethink that because I think um, there's a lot we're missing, and, and it's important that we make those investments. Thank you. Very good. Okay, our last commentator, questioner. <laughs> Hi, all. Uh, Rachel Ansley from Duke University. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm actually really grateful to be following my question after the comments that were just shared, because also focused on sort of the early childhood development angle. Um, but I'd be curious to hear y'all your thoughts on um, the role that healing has to play in resilience, and to what extent that needs to be a part of the equation, and if so, what that looks like. Thinking particularly about um, children, how they are affected uh, and grow in FCV contexts, and how that continues to affect them throughout their lives. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. We've, we'll use a one minute per panelist to uh, get some responses to whichever aspect of that you think you can provide a thoughtful and useful response to. Um, Sarah, we'll start with you this time. <laughs> thank you. I, thank you for all of the great and very, very challenging questions. Um, so I think I'll try to link a few in my, in my one minute. Um, so on the concept of unresilience, which I think we've just introduced here, so that's fantastic. Um, I, I think this points to another assumption, which is that we tend to take resilience for granted. Um, to take the metaphor of Lucy's garden, we do all the things and then we just think, okay, well, we watered it last week, so it's going to be fine next month. Um, and that's not how it works. And that then to link to the question about resources and access to support systems at the very local level. So I think this is happening from global level all the way down to local level. There's an assumption that if resilience is there, it's there. Um, but actually we know that it needs to be properly resourced and properly supported and properly understood. And it is a dynamic thing in and of itself. And we really need to keep watching it um, so that we can understand how it's developing, how it's evolving, where it might be eroding, where our activities might be eroding it. Um, so I absolutely hope, because as you can tell from my, my hope for, I'm a silver lining person, um, that this moment 
of, I don't even know what adjective to use for this moment we're going through as a development community, a peace building community, as a global community. If there is one thing to emerge from this, it's that a lot of the things that we took for granted, we no longer will. And we'll realize that we actually need to continue to support, continue to nurture, continue to water and fertilize uh, this, this garden and really take, take better care of it than we have been. Very good. Patty. Yeah, I'll try and take a few of them quickly. Um, on the, the last point on healing, absolutely. And this is one agenda I've been trying to push a little bit in the bank is the work on psychosocial trauma, uh, where we have very scattered examples in a few countries, but this is not something the bank is supporting at scale. And actually it's very difficult to support at scale because some of this is quite technical knowledge and the capacity is often not there. So in the absence of that, how do we start to build up mechanisms that can do to some extent the clinical side, but also the way in which social healing can help as well? So I don't have any answers on that, but I do think that's something we we need to prioritize. On how do we measure? There's, this, there's advantages and disadvantages to, to measuring, right? The disadvantages, we can get too caught up in the specific indicators and think we've reached a goal when we're heading in the wrong direction. Um, the advantages are they can help us learn as we go along and they can help us focus as well. And I think resilience in the same way as multidimensional poverty is a concept that takes us beyond just very minimal ways of, of understanding um, needs. Um, so I'm gonna give you some concrete answers because I'm actually working on a paper with some of my colleagues on how to measure resilience. And the reason we're doing this is increasingly World Bank project documents are talking about how they're gonna build resilience. And then team leaders have got no idea what, you know, what do we put in our results framework? So we're gonna have our first goal, and um, no doubt we'll get shot down by Marika and many others uh, about how, anyway. how, re how reductionist we are. <laughs> but we, we basically have an analytic framework where we're looking at three dimensions. So one, let me just talk you through the logic without the indicators. So the logic is, one is the economic realm. If you have more resources, access to resources, your house is less likely to get blown over by a tornado because it's stronger. You're less likely to go into unsustainable debt with the money lender if crisis hits. If things are really bad, you can move away, right? So that's one realm. The second realm is on institutional capacity, both formal and informal. You know, if you have a functioning local government or functioning traditional authorities that are able to help um, put together preparedness plans before disaster comes or that are able to access higher um, resources at a higher level to bring down, that's going to help you as well. And then the third realm is the social relations or collective action. You know, individuals cannot survive by themselves. They are embedded within the communities around them. And where you have very dysfunctional communities who are not able to work together, people are gonna struggle. So it's very reductionist, but we are going to um, test this out, put this together. And I think it's, it's only one way of, of looking at this, but uh, it'd be great later on to get your feedback on that. Fantastic. <laughs> Lucy, penultimate voice. <laughs> Okay, so healing, definitely, I think it's extremely important. Um, it is a challenge to know how to do that. But, I mean, even, even other dimensions of science are telling us that this is crucial. How our brain works, how, what cognitive science tells us about, you know, when, I, when something happens out in front of me, so to speak, in my life, in my community, my daily life, I'm not actually seeing what is happening and making a judgment, okay, what does this suggest for my future? Everything comes from my past. I'm see, I'm projecting my past onto my future continually. And an understanding of that has massive implications when we're thinking about how do we move forward and maybe encourage cooperation or different behaviours among a community or, I mean, even among world leaders. It's uh, it's vast when you think of the, the scope of that. And then early childhood Development, I think that, again, science shows that I've actually been working on a on de designing a project at the moment, de focusing specifically on resilience and maternal health with a goal to supporting um, communities in the context of climate change and environmental challenges, particularly because it's 
I mean, it's really the fertility of your soil. If I go back to my garden metaphor, no matter what you would do, if you are growing, trying to grow something on an area of poor you know, soil that's going to blow away in the wind or the rain, you're going to always be challenged. And that's real. I know this is, you know, to trivialize something very serious, but this is what happens when a child grows up in an area of conflict where not only is the trauma and emotional challenges, but there is uh, poor nutrition, there's the maternal nutrition aspect, and this follows that person throughout life. And I think we don't fully understand the the complications of that, either physically, when we're talking about resilience, emotionally, all of these dimensions. And then finally, just to go to the, the issue around individuals and I might not fully have grasped the question there, but let me give it, um, let me respond to it in my own way. I'm also not a social scientist, but I do observe that we seem to have a an obsession in society, in research and in practice at the moment about individual variation, you know, and diversity. And sometimes I wonder that it's gone too far, that it's it's a bit of a distraction, that we're we can't solve the challenge or understand the problem because there's so much variation. And I don't think that's the case. I think, yes, there is variation, which is extremely important when we're working in some of these areas, but fundamentally human beings are very, very similar. You know, we require physical security, we require health, we require some sense of meaning in life. And, and I wonder that, yeah, our attention may be better focused on higher levels and not getting too stuck in this individual variation. All right, thank you. Rekha, final words. I speak really fast, um, but I want to point, uh, put some emphasis on Penny's point, which is that we would really welcome your feedback. And I hope you all have a little card which uh, gives you a channel for our feedback. If you didn't get one, please pick one up on the way out. And Sarah and I will also be at the reception. So please come and speak to us. But um, I'm going to race through some of my answers. So the one, the first one that I want to obviously address is about the, the replication crisis. And the kind of description of the problem was a beautiful description of the raison d'etre, really, for Busara, which was which is this gigantic data gap, which Joseph Henrich at Harvard uh, in his work in his work on the so-called weird people, although he'd be the first one to then say, this doesn't mean there's a weird and a non-weird world, weird being Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic countries as kind of outlined. So that's exactly the raison d'etre, right? That we're trying to understand what 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 are the what are the systematic variations. And this is maybe on to Lucy's point, not so much the individual variations, but systematic. Henry's work goes really deep into the emergence of institutions over millennia of how these have shaped people. We all know that culture is important and yet we don't take it seriously enough. And we really, really have very, very little information systematically on how populations which aren't U.S. college students or at least Western or Global North inhabitants behave, act, make decisions. And we have also really very little information on how people who have experienced extreme distress um, have been influenced in that. So there's two big gaps. But a quick word on the replication crisis and how it has touched us. So there's kind of two replication Crisa? What's the? I don't even know. <laughs> Crises. Crises. Thank you, non-native speaker. I take that as my excuse. So there's a replication crisis. That research that has been published couldn't actually be replicated from the data sets that went along with it, or the data sets were dodgy, very problematic. That is also kind of, and yes, it's a crisis for the discipline, but it's not the most important crisis for us as such. But for us, the more interesting point is the generalizability crisis, okay. right? So does the research that has been conducted on U.S. citizens give us insights that then can be applied to the citizens of South Sudan? Well, shockingly, the answer is very likely no, right? But for us, it goes deeper than that. And this is how it has touched us, because we would we would say, but you can't even simply transplant the methods. You can't simply say, let's put another experiment into a different context. So what we're really working on, and this is a, a huge project of kind of also maturing is a really deeply interdisciplinary approach to understanding behavior and also asking quite seriously the question, what are contextually appropriate methods in oral societies, in societies where generations carry very different uh, memories and so on. So this is this is a kind of a big, big uh, part of us, of our work. And it's very, very much fledgling. But I want to just very briefly touch on the question that was passed online 
on the role of trust and how to build it. Now, that for me is a really, really fantastic behavioral question because, of course, trust isn't the same in every society. It's not even the same in every situation. Trust is also something that can be very malleable over time. We often think of it as a binary because it's a good mental model, the binary. But trust depends on so many things, right? And it isn't kind of something that just becomes breakable, but it might be stretched over time. and People might make decision on a breach of trust today, but they think of it as, will it pay off in, in 10 years' time? Um, and then just one last bit on this healing and this question of trauma. So I grappled a lot with that. First of all, there's that, again, is very, very culturally specific, and we need a lot more knowledge on this. But I think what's important for me is also to not simply think of trauma, because there's, there's also issues with kind of pathologizing whole populations, the concept that I work with is one of that I call mental landscape, which really kind of tries to appreciate that people operate with many, many layers of memories of making sense of everyday experience of marginalization and how they recognize them, how they explain them with something that maybe happens to their grandparents. So this kind of very, very complex interplay of experiences, memories, decisions that they made 10 years ago based on their mental landscape at the time and how these decisions play out today. Because I think that's a, obviously it's very difficult to kind of get a handle on that, but it does help to also get, move away from a binary of, you know, there's traumatized and non-traumatized. Um, but please come and give us feedback through the card or come and talk to us. Thank you. Very good. A quick final word from me. I'm just going to relay uh, best workshop I've been to in my entire career it was uh, 18 months ago in Canada, where I was invited to be a participant in a discussion where the issue was uh, we've just won multiple billions of dollars uh, for First Nations communities as reparations for the awfulness conducted over a century of taking children away from their parents, uh, taking away their religion, their culture, their language, everything, just so they could be forcefully integrated into Canadian society. And there was an incredible meeting, not just because of what this, at one level, the level, the success of having raised multiple billions to uh, to address this particular question. Uh, but the question was, now the issue was flipped. Okay, we succeeded. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Here now we have to do the opposite, opposite work. Now we've got to be in compliance with Canadian administrative law. Now we've got to train a new generation of social workers. Now we've got to do all this nitty gritty kind of work to enact and fund and target very specific groups for <laughs> very specific reasons and do all the normal work that a big bureaucracy has to do when it tries to engage with these really sensitive questions. And the big question that we spent three hours discussing, one word, neglect. What does neglect mean? <laughs> this is one country uh, with multiple First Nations communities, but with an otherwise uh, a government that's uh, um, at least in one level compared to other countries, uh, very uh, ahead of the curve, shall we say, in trying to address this kind of very deep, tangled question. Uh, and yet it was such a it was so good to be in that room because there was such a willingness and ability to spend three hours having a sensible conversation around this one word <laughs> because everything really did turn on figuring out how we're going to get to agreement on what neglect actually is because that means that's what a social worker will be charged with doing in the middle of February in Saskatchewan of going into a, into a First Nations community and deciding whether neglect has actually occurred in this particular situation and potentially having to take screaming children away from their parents in the name of protecting their particular interests. How fun is that, right? Not fun at all. <laughs> uh, in fact, probably the hardest task I can imagine anybody having to do for, uh, do for a living. So these aren't idle questions. Our organization was not set up to do anything that we're talking about in this room. The word poverty doesn't even occur in the, the articles of association that define this organization, let alone resilience, let alone healing, uh, all that kind of stuff, it, all, that, all, the, all the implications that go with um, a big organization like this trying to render legible all of this kind of talk into ways that can, in fact, be funded can be manifest in designs of projects and policies of one kind or another, then can be implemented, then can be assessed, then can be interpreted, then can be generalized and scaled. That was not one item of, of writing was, was spent trying to figure all that out back in Bretton Woods uh, in the 1940s. 
And I think our generational task essentially is to figure out how do we help or construct a different parallel aspect to this work of, of multilateral or bilateral or NGO work such that we can be, on the one hand, faithful to the bureaucratic imperatives that run our lives, that pay our salaries and our pensions and all those other normal but boring things. But how do we get them to do this very different kind of essentially contested work? And that's the holy grail. I will be long in my grave before anybody starts to make real progress on that. But I like to think that that's what we're doing right now in our own way is having these hard conversations around super important issues that we can all agree at one level are indeed important, but they just don't map obviously or clearly onto our definitions, onto our tools, onto our administrative instruments, onto the standard ways in which we want to make big claims about the impact or whether this works or whether it doesn't, whether we can scale it, whether we can't, whether we can replicate it, whether we can't. Nothing that we're really talking about here is normal social science, and yet we have to make it normal. And that's going to require very different kinds of skill sets, mindsets, and temperaments <laughs> to be able to have these kinds of conversations um, more regularly doesn't mean anything goes. It just means there has to be a, a, a scientific recognition of scope conditions. There, 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 are para, there are boundaries around which our knowledge claims work, and we have to be vastly more sensitive to that. Thank you for everybody. Um, they, there is following this gathering a, a, a one-hour coffee and networking break, uh, 45 minutes for everybody else in this room. Um, and the Change Makers event, if you were hoping that was going to happen today, it's actually been rescheduled tomorrow at uh, 12.15. So you'd, you're not missing out on, on that today, at least. But of course. There's also, if this conversation will be continued to a certain degree, some side of it um, at an evidence session, building the evidence on building resilience tomorrow in this room, as I would say, as a Batman Gleach, same bat time, same bat channel at 1.30. So please come back and, and continue the conversation then. Thank you. Very good.